And we picture ourselves now on top of a beautiful mountain in the center of a circular grove of trees. And in the center of our circle, a bonfire blazes forth and it lights us and the grove up with a sacred golden light. And into the sacred space now we call upon our Divine Father and Mother, all the teachers and angels. And we ask that we be guided and led as we walk the way of wisdom. Thank you very much. Together we say, blessed be. So tonight we're talking about reclaiming our power. And I think it's important to understand that before we can reclaim our power, we have to recognize what power is and what it's not. And in this world, everything is backwards. Everything is flipped. What we think is true is not true. And what we think is not true is true. And um, we have it all backwards. And so if we... If we take a uh, cue from the 12-step program in Alcoholics Anonymous, they tell us, and I'm, I'm not a 12-step person, so don't worry, we're not going to start doing anything that you don't want to do with that. But, but there's a lot of wisdom there, and, um, and, I, and it's a very effective program for a lot of people that, um, in fact, over a, m a long period of time, many people who have been powerless over alcohol have found their way. Uh, to sanity through this program, and so that in that regard, it's very divinely inspired. Um, but the 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 beauty of the twelve step program is that the first step is understanding that the alcoholic is powerless over the alcohol, and until they can get to that point of recognizing that they're powerless over alcohol the alcohol has power over them. And in recognizing their powerlessness, they are able to reclaim their power. Now, the, the next step, and this is the, and I don't care what jargon you use, this is the step to sanity. This is the, the way of sanity for any, any legitimate spiritual path is recognizing that you are powerless and that there is a power that's higher than you that can restore you. So recognizing that you are connected to a source that is all-powerful and that in whose presence you are powerless gives you all power in the world. Um, we look to the world for our power. We look to money for our power. We look to our job for our power. We look to our uh, relationships or lack thereof for our power. We look um, to definitely to advertising to, for our power. We are in a world that we, and, and if it wasn't this, it would be something else. And generations ago, when we didn't have television and all of that, we had other things. We had, we had the monarchy telling us what to do. And so it's part of the human condition that there is a, what, what um, many people call a racial consciousness or a species remembrance that is based on tell me what to do, tell me where to go, and but make me think that I'm powerful. Because the best way that the, that the ego mind or the race consciousness or whatever you want to call it can have power over us is by letting us think that we're powerful. Once again, with the alcohol, with the alcoholic, I can stop drinking. I just drink at parties, or I just drink to unwind, or whatever. As long as they think they're in control, the alcohol has power over them. As long as we think we're in control, whatever our stuff is, and we're no different, we just don't use maybe, I mean, I, don't, I can't, I'm not going to assume that anybody in here isn't an alcoholic, but it doesn't matter if you are or if you aren't, you have something. You have some, or probably a lot of things, if you're anything like me, most things, you know, that run your life. But it's important to recognize that in the, in, in the sense of who we are, we, when we can get to the core of who we are, we don't need any of that stuff. We don't need anything outside of us to, 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 to give us power. But we don't want to see that. I was talking to a group of people the other night, and... This one young lady said, you know, I know all this stuff, okay? I know 
what I need to do to make my life perfect and beautiful. And I have all of this power, all of this knowledge, all of this ability, and I want to do it, but I, I just watch myself not doing it. I just watch myself not doing it. And I said, you know what? It's not that you're bad. It's not that you're... Um, it's not that you don't want to get better. It's not that you're uh, not smart enough. It's not that you don't have what it takes. It's just like the rest of us, that you're paralyzed. You are absolutely paralyzed. You are terrified. We are all terrified. I, what, I wake up some nights just terrified, you know, just terrified of, of this world that we live in, this, this mortal world. I'm thinking, God, you know, is this it? And when I, I mean, I love the, I love the theories. I love, I love what my religion teaches me about what happens after I die. But I don't know, you know, is it true? Right? Maybe, maybe, maybe there is nothing, you know. And so that's very scary. But what happens is that when we are unable to recognize those fears as what they are and experience them and feel powerless. And we get this illusion that we're in control and that we're in, you know, that we're in charge, and which is where a lot of religion comes from, is giving people the tools to um, erroneously think that they can really be in charge of their lives because uh, there's a system that they can follow and then they'll get to heaven or whatever. Until we can get to the point where we realize that we don't know. We don't know anything. It's all a mystery. And that... There's absolutely no guarantees for any of us. And to totally be able to get into that kind of terror and beyond what's on the other side of that, that we can reclaim our power. We have to go through what a lot of the occult traditions call the dark night of the soul. <clears throat> and people people call it, you know, the dark tea time of the soul. But, but it's really not the dark tea time of the soul. It's the dark, terrifying night of the soul where you don't have any power over anything in the world. You have no power over yourself and you're absolutely um, not at cause of anything. But what that is, when you recognize when you're on the other side of that, it's just like if you've ever had a really bad acid trip. Once you're done with it, once it's over, you know, and you realize, mm, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. The other side of that terror is the recognition that all of that fear, all of that neuroses, all of that pathos, all of that darkness has absolutely no power over you because it has nothing to do with who you are. The scary part of that is until we are able and willing to go through that terror, we are always going to be run by it. Does that make at least a little bit of theoretical sense to us? So, what we need to do is start looking at the things that we don't want to look at in ourselves and in the world. You know, like what I mean, what what all the what ifs? What are the what's the worst case scenarios? You know that that and recognize those things which really run us. The ones that we you're always you know running away from and don't want to look at and you know and uh, I don't want to I don't want to be there. I don't want to even look at the possibility of that. And recognize that when we push that just underneath the surface of our consciousness, it has us. We have no power, right? And so then we look to things outside of us to give us a sense of security. We look to religion. We look to politics. We look to government. We look to money. We look to sex. We look to drugs. We look to whatever we can find that is going to give us some sense of security in a very unsecure world. This world is mortal. There is nothing in this world that's going to last. There is absolutely nothing in this world that can give you any lasting sense of peace. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. It's just the nature of mortal existence. The mortal world is mortal. It dies. Your body will die. It's already dying and reliving. You know, it's, our, it's, it's already in the process every seven years of giving you a new one, a new body, right? Relationships will die. Friendships will die. Your car will die. Things will die. All this, your, your bank account will eventually die. Eventually your currency will be worth nothing in some other existence. You know what I'm saying? All societies rise and fall. You know, America will eventually die. Maybe not in this lifetime, but the, the point is 
the idea that we hold on to that these things shouldn't die, that's where our powerlessness lies. We are looking to the mortal world for immortality, whereas immortality lies within us. And that's what in in and here you know I'm I'm not knocking spiritual traditions because without what I consider valid spiritual tra traditions we don't have a a, a place a, a context from which to explore these things. But um, in my spiritual tradition in, in that that I follow in the DCW we we have a context we have a cosmology but we don't have a belief system and that's kind of why I'm in it because. In, in, uh, that's why I think I, I gravitated towards that and, and, and why I, I'm interested in any kind of spiritual path that gives you a, a framework but doesn't give you a belief system. Because if it's going to be a real valid spiritual path, it's not something to believe in, but it's something for you to investigate. So in, so within my, my own understanding of, of my own spiritual path, where God lives is in side of us is in at the very core of who we are you know at the core of us is uh, we are literally children of god we are literally children of light but until we are able to go through the darkness to find that light till until we're able to go through all of that terror and fear that we are not willing to experience it's all a big theory it's just a a nice thing to think, oh yes, we're all creatures of love and light, and isn't that beautiful? And we can just impress ourselves by talking like that, right? But it's so bogus in the hands of that, what A Course in Miracles calls that ego mind, that, that, that doesn't want you to go through terror, that doesn't want you to get to the other side of that. Now, I'm not saying that in order to be spiritually enlightened and reclaim your power that you have to live in terror. Absolutely not. In fact, it's the opposite. But I am saying that until you're willing to look at the terror, you are living in terror, but you're just turning the light off. It's like the image that I like to use a lot is your room gets so messy that instead of cleaning it up, you just turn off the light. And then you think, oh, it's not messy. I just don't see it, you know, until you start tripping over the dirt and tripping over the clutter. And that's why uh, one of the best things that can happen for us in, in, a, in, in our lives is when we, quote, bottom out. When we hit rock bottom, when we can be in a pl place like uh, that's why a lot of people with a lot of money, people that have like unlimited wealth, like that they've inherited, they have billions of dollars and they're never going to run through it. The kinds of people that can never run through money, oftentimes never have a way in which to bottom out. They don't have a way to bottom out. They can't. They're 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 they are continually supported in their sickness, and they'll never. They'll never be able to hit bottom. I'm not saying that all wealthy people are, are, are like this, but I mean, if you're if you're in a in a any any kind of a place where you're always holding that fear at bay from yourself, and you can never, and the universe can never kind of get in and just say, "Look, we have to take you know a stick of dynamite to your life and just blow it apart, so that you can just stop thinking that this is real. Stop thinking that that the things that give you security are real then once you can blow that stuff apart once you can g become free even for a moment from that stuff then you can understand what power is it's not personal power it's universal power because the idea of personal power is just another illusion that i have me my own identity and my own power and my own money and my own this and my own that. It's just another part of the illusion that keeps us from being powerful. So when uh, when we say, okay, I want to be on a, quote, spiritual path and I'm just really ready to grow and I want to reclaim my own power, the universe says, really? Are you sure? And we say, yeah. And then it says, well, okay, you asked for it. <laughs> You know, and it's not because it's a. It's not because it's um, God is being cruel. It's because God is being beneficent. There's a. There was a book called Crack in the Cosmic Egg that came out a million years ago, and um, the idea of spiritual breakthroughs 
being a violent act was something that I thought was very interesting. It's like when the, when the chicken is in the egg, the point at which the egg becomes a hostile environment for the chicken is when the, or in, um, in, in the womb, when the womb becomes toxic to the baby, basically, any more time in that womb is going to be toxic right this wave of determination comes over the baby and the right hormones are 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 um released and birth happens and it's violent birth anybody had a kid in here or anybody seen a birth it's violent it's not it's not like bambi you know it's it's very very violent when a ba- when a chicken cracks open the egg to be born into the world it's violent because the old universe that they were living has become toxic to them so when you want to become powerful that's saying that i want to be quote reborn i want to be born into a new universe i want to be born into a universe of all power the universe will support that but it's understand that that the old you needs to become toxic the old womb needs to become unfriendly to you because you've outgrown it so again i'm not saying that you should go look for and search for negative experiences in order to be enlightened not at all i think that the more peace and the more love and the more joy we can have the better but that it is sometimes one of the most beautiful experiences uh, are are the ones that we are the most afraid of the ones that we don't want to go through like if anybody in here has ever been through any good therapy now there's therapy and there's therapy but I'm talking about if you've ever been through psychotherapy and it's actually done something for you it's actually worked it's actually gotten you healthy on any level you don't go there and just chat and the and the therapist doesn't just go there and tell you how wonderful you are and and how great your life is and oh, you're just so cute you know if it did that you should fire the therapist right the best therapist is the one that's going to say okay we need to bust you on your games we need to bust you on on the numbers that you're running in your life you know you have 99% bullshit going on with you okay and that 1% of you that wants to come through that is what we need to focus on right so when you say i want to be healthy i want to be powerful the universe's job is to bust you on your bullshit that's the way it works and so the old stuff doesn't work anymore your old games don't work anymore it's like uh somebody uh, somebody was like mentioning this whole concept and and it's like my wand my wand you know the old stuff doesn't work anymore all the old games that we used to play all the old magic that we could the old glamours that we used to be able to cast on people doesn't work anymore for us because we've stated to the universe i want to be better i want to be healthy i want to be healed i want to be powerful i want to reclaim my power right and the universe is okay but in order for you to do that all your powerlessness has to be dissolved and the problem with that is that we are so in love with our powerlessness. We are so in love with our problems. We are so absolutely enamored by our illusions of ourselves and our illusions of the world. I was I was um listening to uh the radio and they were talking about how uh George W. Bush's um new um defense minister, whatever his name, whatever the title is, his you know, he's rethinking the whole military now you know we need to rethink this whole thing and from you know bottom up we have to just you know revamp the whole thing because he said something like we need to look at what the next war is really going to be like and part of me thought you know that's not a very positive way of thinking but the other part of me thought that's a very realistic way of thinking he's not necessarily being the prophet of doom he's actually making a very honest statement Look, there's going to be a war on this planet. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to approach that? And that's I think a very powerful place to be in rather than this half-baked new age metaphysics that's so 90s. 
that's so 80s, you know, that's so passe is just think lovely thoughts and just everybody's wonderful and we never get angry and we all live in nirvana and it's just garbage. It's just not real because if we all lived in nirvana, we wouldn't be run by all of this, this stuff that we do. We are not above it all here. None of us in this room are just, I mean, unless you're a saint and I don't know you yet, but we are not above all of the games that are played. You know, I, I see people in the, um, the so-called spiritual community just like acting like there's, you know, like when, when, when something happens politically, just like, oh, those unenlightened people, how could they be that way? It's like, who, who are you to judge that they're unenlightened? You know, none of us, none of us are in a position to judge anybody's progress. But what we are in a position to do is say, look, I am powerless over my own games that I play, over my own neuroses, over my own addictions. And I'm going to call upon a power that is higher than I to restore me to sanity and mean it and really mean it and to act like it right but the thing is is once you say that you can't turn back you can't i mean when, now that you've heard this tonight if you've never really thought in these terms your life can never really be the same again you can't really go back to the old way so we have to get off our all of our old um uh treadmills that we've been on of um you know what what we think brings us joy and what we think brings us power and what we think we want out of life, right? We think we want more money and we think we want more, um, you know, what we call love, which I don't think most of us really understand what love is, but we think we do and we want more of that. We want more things. We want more prestige. We want... We want to be stars or we want to be, um, you know, whatever, whatever your thing is. You want more of something that is actually anesthetizing you to your power. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, can everybody think right now, what is it that I want out of the world? What I want out of life? And just be ruth ruthlessly honest with yourself and try not to think of yourself as an enlightened being right now. And just really think for a moment about those things in your life that you just lust after, that you think you need, right? That, and, and if you're in a spiritual life, then you're probably learning how to be really subtle. You know, you have to learn how to really, I know I do that. I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm not really materialistic. I, you know, but the thing about it is spiritual, there's all kinds of materialism. Some of the people in the world that don't appear to be materialistic are extremely materialistic because there's spiritual materialism. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron or, or, or a dichotomy, but there is a spiritual materialism in that the, the image of being spiritual, the image of being enlightened, the image of being at peace, the image of being loving, the image of all of that crap, right? Which is just as bogus as, anybody, as anything else. It's totally bogus, right? So we have to get to, to a point where we can look at ourselves and just say, okay, well, what are these things in me that, I, that I'm lusting after? And don't judge it. You know, one of the first things that any wisdom school teaches is know yourself. Know your Gurdjieff stated it. Eli stated it. The, um, the um, rites of Eleusis stated it. The e ancient Egyptians stated it. It's all the same thing. The first thing you got to do is know yourself. Well, we want to know certain parts of ourselves, right? And this is how it works. All the all the stuff that is off in our personalities, we don't want to see it. And we don't want to look at it. But at the, by the same token, all of the strengths that we have, all of the all of the strides that we've made, and all of the uh, the places in which we've really gotten stuff together that was really hard for us, we won't acknowledge ourselves for that either. Does that make sense? It's just like we've got, we've got it totally backwards. What we need to be doing is acknowledging ourselves for our strengths and looking at un, 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 uh, ashamedly at our weaknesses. But we don't want to do that. We have it the opposite. 
we we rationalize our, our weaknesses, you know, or we hide them, or we make them look pretty. That's what a lot of us do, actually, is we, 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 it smells funny, so we put perfume on it. You know what I mean? So that's kind of how we handle our weaknesses and our neuroses. And we don't acknowledge where, where it is that we've actually come so far in this life. I mean, you can't but progress. You can't help it. Even if you, even if you, delay it for millions of lifetimes it's not your choice it's in your makeup it's in your spiritual makeup you were created to become more to become better to become stronger to become more powerful it's in the stars it's how we were created the universe is expanding and so are you we are all growing so what happens is when we take these inventories when we take when we take this look at ourselves we need to start being able to let go of our judgment about ourselves and recognize that all of the places that we think we have it together, we don't. But at the same time, a lot of the places where we don't really know ourselves are our, our greatest strengths. And this is what I mean. There's a lot of, um, a lot of my life, uh, especially during my 20s, there were a lot of things about myself that I just really thought I was really good at and I was really cool with, and I just, you know, I really prided myself on certain personality traits. And um, especially, you know, I was very outgoing and very, you know, on fire, and I could just get a lot done and all that stuff, and I thought that was really great. And a lot of the places that I felt sort of uncomfortable with myself, like intimacy, myself, <laughs> that's, a, that's a truth too, myself, I like intimacy and like... Um, uh, just um, discipline and and um, and being uh, being sort of mature in, in doing the right thing. Um, I, I felt like I, I was not together. But then I looked at my I, I, when I look back at my twenties and I look at that all those places where I thought I was so strong. I was I was acting. Does that make sense? I was acting. I, I was I was pretending. I was faking it. Because I wanted to be strong in those areas. And then those other places where I was like so afraid that I wasn't ever going to amount to much in certain areas of my life. Those areas are the places where I secretly, secretly even from myself, worked on. And those were actually my strengths. And the places where I thought I was strong were actually my weaknesses. And the places where I thought that I was an adult, I was so childish. And the places where I thought I wasn't very mature, I was so, became actually very adult-like. And this is why I think, and I think it's the truth for all of us, is because in those places where we're, where we're not really comfortable, we have a certain humility, right? We have a certain humility about ourselves. And when there's humility, there's like blessing. The universe just pours blessing out onto that. But where we have this sort of arrogance and we think we've got it together, the universe won't support that. So the, I think the bottom line when we're talking about how, how the world works in terms of power is that the world is backwards. And when we look to anything in the world to give us power, we are looking into darkness. We're looking into utter void because the world doesn't really exist. And I was listening to a f uh, um, physicist. I would say physician, and that's not right. A physicist. I was listening to a physicist, and there's this new, this oh, and this is like so, I mean, this is like branding, this is like cutting edge, this is like today, this new tech stuff that they're finding out about physics. All the particles, all the subatomic particles they've had, you know, the new physics has had a, like a heyday for about 30 years now, where they've had almost all, um, uh, 100% um, conformity within their theories, where they haven't been able to bust the theories open, right? Well, where they've been, where the theories are starting to break down, which is a good sign, which that means progress. Whenever a theory breaks down, that means we're progressing. And then the, but the dinosaurs consider that as a threat, right? Where we are progressing now is the understanding that there are particles that cannot be detected yet, but their presence can be detected. And what they are is that every single particle has a partner. There is a physi a, uh, in physics, there is an applied physics understanding 
of an alternate, an alternate universe, an alternate reality that's always existing. Now, to a metaphysician, that's like, oh, big deal. It's a huge deal, though, because it's scientific. It's scientific. It means that there are, that there, wherever there is one reality, there is a partner reality. Wherever we talk in, in DCW, we say we're the mortal world, and then we. Oh, that's my that's my tradition, the Druidic craft of the wise. And it doesn't matter what tradition. All spiritual traditions have, all tr- spiritual tr- traditions that are, um, in search of truth, have this understanding that there are two parts of reality. There's the physical reality. But then there's also the metaphysical reality or the mental reality, and they are partners. And one can be seen, the other one can only be detected. But now that's physics. That's, that's real scientific fact. And the, and the, the, the good news in tonight about that is that in our power, in our, in our quest for power, what we look toward for power is the reflection, not the reality. So what we have to look at is... What is the, what is God giving us in terms of power versus what is the world offering us in terms of power? And learn how to flip it like almost consistently. What am I looking for? What is, what am I, what am I searching for? Well, what's the opposite, right? What, what am I, 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 I need, I need self-validation and I need, I need a sense of power. So I need money, right? Well, why I'm looking for money is because I don't feel prosperous. Why I'm looking for money is because I don't feel like I'm enough. So where am I going to look to for that money, for that sense of prosperity? Am I going to look to money? Well, if you do, it's going to be destroyed. If you look to the stock market for your salvation, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle. But if you look to the spiritual center within you for that unlimited sense of prosperity, then it has to have its own partner in the physical world. So when you find that sense of prosperity within you, you can't help but have the expression of prosperity. But it's not because you were looking for the money. The money is just a byproduct of finding the inner prosperity within you. It was not your goal. If the money was your goal, then you're looking into darkness. Does that make sense? Same thing with relationships. We look to relationships for a sense of something, right? But they rob us of our power when we do that. Because what we want to do is find that relationship with God within us, however you want to call it, whatever you want to call it, within us. And the partner happens, because, not because the partner is any more any, the goal any longer, but because in order for us to have uh, growth in certain areas, many times, a lot of times, you need to have a partner to do that, right? But of course, in miracles says that there's several levels of partnership, and these so-called life partners, these marriages, the husbands or wives or spouses or whatever that everybody thinks they need, well, they serve a purpose spiritually, but they're not the same. They're not the same purpose as what we think they are when we think of romantic love. What they are is that they're there to teach us. But the problem is that when the lesson has been learned, then those two bodies separate. And it may be a lifelong thing where they separate at death, or they may break up. But they will separate because the relationship is the mortal side of it. The immortal side of it is that connection with God. Does that make sense? It's so, it's so important that we understand where our power comes from. Our power comes from that eternal sense of power from within us, not the world, not the realm of darkness. And again, darkness is not bad. There's nothing wrong with darkness. Darkness is just the absence of light, right? And, and in fact, in, 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 in Wicca, it's to, and, and also in uh, Taoism, the yin and the yang, they, they, they actually coexist very peacefully. But the one is the world of cause and the other one is the world of effect. And if you're looking into the world of effect to give you sustenance, then you're looking into uh, the after effect. You're, you're looking to, you're looking to um, something that's already happened. You're looking into history. I mean, by definition, oh, and the other exciting thing is, you know, they've been able to, these physicists have been able to isolate, this is like so cutting edge, they've been able to isolate the moment 
like they called it the nano second after whatever the words are after the big bang they have been able to recreate the conditions of the big bang up to the, like this nano second after afterwards so it's the closest they've ever been able to come to actually looking at the creation of life the creation of life as we know it in the mortal world okay but the thing is is even they these physicists par excellence of the 21st century can only look at history they can they can get really close but they can never get to it because the zen of the whole thing is that now can only be experienced in now and that's where your power is in this this moment if you're looking into anything other than this moment you're looking into the history and if you're looking into history how can you find power there how can you find power in something that's already happened right so if we want to be the real movers and shakers in this world if we want to really make make a difference in the world the only difference we can make is being here now right being in this moment at all times and understanding that in this moment anything can happen but all of the tragedy all of the fear all of the pathos all that stuff that we're afraid of looking at that we we're talking about earlier doesn't happen here and now it happens in the future or it's just happened even in an earthquake you're only seeing the damage as it's occurred does that make sense the safety of finding real power is the fact that in the moment nothing can happen in this moment in that mano nano wano wano second after it happens is where the destruction occurs right so this world always happens after this fact this world always happens this millisecond after the fact so because of that when we look to this world for power we're looking into history the real power lies in the fact that now this moment this moment that's where god lives inside of us is in this moment this present time that's where our power is if we want to make a difference in the world if we want to take and make a difference in our lives we have to live there and we have to be committed to living there and in so doing there is also planning and goal setting and all of that stuff that doesn't mean that but but you can do it consciously this is all about consciousness like i i save money i invest in the stock market i do all that stuff i love it i mean i i i i love money i think it's thrilling i love money i think money is fabulous but i don't look to it for my salvation i know that it's going to go away even at least after i die at least hopefully after i die because i want to be able to do something with it <laughs> um but the only way that i can be enlightened when i work with money is by being here now not by not by fearing what's going to happen if i don't have money or not by greeting lusting after oh i want that money because there's something in there that's going to make me feel good about myself self there i go again it's in this moment here and now the universe is presenting this to me and what am i going to do what what am i what what am i going to do with this now remember that in the in the world you are, you are not as free as you think you are and the way that the ego mind keeps you its prisoner is by letting you think you're free okay so you want you want to you want to enslave people you make them think they're free real real slavery real slavery has nothing to do with how it looks because if people think they're enslaved even if it takes generations they're going to break free from it but if you want to know what real slavery is it comes from inside your own mind and that's where inside your mind you think oh i can do whatever i want you know i have this and i have that and i i can um um uh, do anything that i want in this world and i'm perfectly at liberty to do that and the, what we don't recognize is that no that's not true what's true is that you are driven by the race consciousness you are driven by your own sense of emotions you're driven by your own what ken keys called your emotion back desires in in any moment um if you're not literally living in the moment here and now and being fully aware in that moment you have absolutely no freedom you have absolutely no power because your emotions are driving you you are gravitating toward this or that or the other thing you're you're being driven by your hungers and your desires and your fears and your phobias and all that stuff right 
So the only way to break free from that is to recognize that that's true. To recognize that you're not so special. You're not so incredible. And at the same time, you're a child of God. You know, there's that, you gotta get both. Me, as myself, as this little ego, I'm a speck of dust. I'm nothing. But, as a child of God, I have all power. But as a child of God, I have to be willing to let go my false conceptions of who I am and what I'm here for and my own personal agenda about my life because God's power will not be contained within this false vessel that I've created for myself. Does that make sense? God's power, if we let it go move through us in the present moment, will literally move mountains. We have the power to literally move. Moving mountains, the Course of Miracles says, is small. It's just nothing compared to what we can do. I mean, there's literally nothing we cannot accomplish. That's how powerful we have been created to be. But our false conception of ourselves, which is part of this whole interconnected matrix of illusion that we all are in conspiracy to hold on to, is what, what a lot of us, like I say, call the race consciousness. We are all conspiring to keep ourselves at bay, to keep ourselves down, and to keep God from shining through. And we all do it. And, and, have you, and, and you can tell, you can see just on a real practical level, you get a little bit happy, and you'll see how your friends really react to you. You get a little success in your life, you'll see how people like don't want you to, you know, don't, don't get too good, don't get too fabulous. When people get like really fabulous, really like say wealthy, or they get really famous, or they do some incredible thing, and it's just kind of out of the blue, and nobody knew they had a minute, like the lady that did the, um, uh, this children's books, the um, what are they called? The big selling children's books right now? Yeah, Harry Potter books. Nobody had any idea she could even like write, let alone write like that, epically, like incredibly, like make make a huge new era in children's fiction. Uh, you can bet her acquaintances are not being too kind to her right now because they're so jealous. And I've seen it happen. You see it happen all the time. So, and we do it too. Everybody's jealous of everybody else. And you can be a little bit successful, but, you know, not as long as you don't bypass me. So, um, but that's how it is. But that's how we all are. We're all in this matrix of, uh, did you see the movie, The Matrix? The, the movie? It was a bit glorified of gun violence for my taste, but, but it was, it was actually quite an enlightened message that <laughs> you're not so free. You think, but again, how, how they depicted that was brilliant. It was very zen, actually, because what we think is our, our freedoms, when you look at it from another perspective, it's just like, I am a robot. I have absolutely no freedom. Gurdjieff said we are all machines. We are just machines. And the only people that can really do something are ones that can break free from those machines, but they are usually ridiculed. They are usually persecuted by society. Now, luckily, we're living in... This the other side of the dawning of the age of Aquarius, where there is more available to us than ever before, and we are not as persecuted as we used to be when we when we really break through that. So we have a lot. We are actually living in a very exciting time for um, spiritual awakening and understanding. And I think it's important for us to uh, kind of like ride the wave and recognize that there that we have less to be fearful of in 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 terms of what the world will do to us when we break free. But in order to break free, you have to be willing to lose it all. You have to be willing to lose who you think you are. You have to be willing to lose all of your friends. You have to be willing to never write the great novel. You have to be willing to, you know, that's a really powerful place to be. What if it doesn't ever happen for you? What happens if this is it? What happens if this is how much money you make? What happens if this is how... You know what it is, and there's no big accomplishment for you. There is nothing more than this. If you can't make it through that dark night of the soul, and that's terrifying for me, uh, you know, to recognize, okay, this could be it. But when I get to that spot where this could be it, I recognize how much it this really is, because it has nothing to do with what's being manifest on the physical world. It has everything to do with this infinite universe that is just the starburst. It's like we're living in the midst of this supernova and we don't want to look at it, so we, you know, we, we go shopping. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we are living in the midst of like so much power, but we can't handle it that we just go out and go to the movies or watch television because we can't handle how powerful we really are. 
if we were really going to look at how powerful we really are, not only would we have to, like, mm, you know, get a new job, but we'd have to literally, like, lose all of our illusions about ourselves because it's so bogus. It's so bogus who we think we are and why we think we're here. So we don't, the, the question isn't, how can I regain my power? How can I claim back my power? The question really is, how can I let go of the fear and terror of seeing how powerful I really am? Right? And not you personally. You are no more powerful than any of the rest of us because we're all one big giant starburst together with different bodies looking at each other, but we're really the same person. That's the truth of the matter. We're all one star. And, you know, we can't handle that, so we, like, fragment it off into a bunch of little bodies, and we said, okay, I'm over here, you're over here. We all have our little identities and our little egos, and we're going to play nice. You know? We're going to pretend. And if there is, I always say, a big satanic force in the universe that's out to get us and there's big Armageddon and all that stuff, it's going to happen very politely. It's going to happen very, very politely. Because we'll never want, we don't want to make waves, right? Anyway, so um, let's just do a little meditation and then we'll do our next little bit. Close our eyes and we relax the body. And we feel within ourselves a sense of peace. We call upon the God and Goddess. We call upon the Creator in whatever form is comfortable to us. And we ask in this moment to be shown just a glimpse of our true, powerful self. We're willing to let go just for a moment any preconceived notions of who we are. Willing to let go of our false humility and our arrogance. We dedicate this moment now to our Creator and we ask that we be led and that we be guided as we leave this place tonight to remembering to be here now in this moment at all times and to be protected from our own wandering minds that would have us go off into a million different directions and rob us of our power. Thank you very much. Together we say blessed be.